Greetings acolytes of the Celestial Emaxon, welcome to Emax at Lunch. We've got an amazing series of videos coming up because we're beginning to break into a very deep pool of value with tool use in GPTEL. Today we're going to demonstrate that value and then we're going to characterize it to get people moving in the right direction to reap the benefits. Whenever we need to make our first set of changes to a piece of software, it's usually not the changes that are the hard part. It's usually the upfront cost of figuring out how the software is put together to determine how the changes are going to fit. For this first example, we're going to use GPTEL with the tools to analyze GPTEL. Before we even start, I know GPTEL is juggling requests, so I just want to know how does it manage the life cycle of those requests. Sure enough, it pretty quickly discovers that there's a state machine, and because I'm a software engineer, I know that if I know the state transitions, I pretty much know the behavior of the life cycle. So next we ask it to find the list of states, which is not hard once you see it, but sometimes you would have to scan through the source, and here it's looking through some functions that are probably using the states, but it's already read the entire library earlier in the context, and so before long it decides, yep, that's the list of states, and then it spits them out. Now we can go to our exact match tools, and if we had to dissect the rest of this library, we're in business. For this next example, we're going to leverage the good old eList manual. The problem is I want to write to a file, and I want to append to a file. I know the difference between writing and appending, but looking through the manual to figure out which of the functions are intended to be used with that level of control, and from an eList program, not bound to a key sequence as a user command, sometimes that takes an annoying amount of time. So I've remixed a little bit of the info infrastructure. We're feeding it into the LLM. It has enough semantic awareness to kind of figure out which of these functions are intended to be used in which ways. It finds two promising looking functions and I'm pretty sure that one is used to implement the other. And to satisfy that curiosity, I ask it to look them up where I know it's incidentally going to see the argument list which can tell me which one is designed to be used with the level of control that we need. For our last appetizer, I was testing to see if I could get it to look up a relationship between two packages that rely on this same built-in infrastructure. I was asking about the prescient and orderless package, expecting to find something about completions and completion frameworks. But what I realized was really impressive about this example was that it was looking through both packages simultaneously. So we're doing recursive lookup in two different places. Now, I can do a lot of things fast. I can't read two things in two places at once. At length, it concludes pretty correctly that these are two similar but distinct packages that affect completions in unique ways. With a bit of prodding, it ends up looking at the function completions for Prescient, through which it probably discovers that Ivy Prescient is installed, and so then it starts exploring the relationship between Ivy and Prescient. The other thing I found encouraging about this example was the depth of the recursive lookup. How many times when you're looking through a package, you wind up looking through a function, to look through a function, to look through a function, to finally get to the implementation. And because everything that we're seeing is about eList programming and packages that we use to add utility to email, Emacs, this is an example of using Emacs to make yourself faster at making Emacs faster, faster. This is how programmable tools are reintegrating through the disruptions faster and how they're going to accelerate past their more focused IDE counterparts. So now that we've whet our appetite, let's ask ourselves, what problems are we solving? We all know that Emacs has absolutely excellent manuals and introspection tools, and that great Emacs users get almost all their information from these tools. We bounce from key maps to commands to function sources to important variables, controlling settings, all the time, very quickly, with very little effort. And this is extremely fast once we know the names for things. What is the data model of Emacs? What are the primitive types? But when we don't quite know the exact match and we can't quite think of the right category in the manual, we need semantic search and we need the right pieces of the manual. The manual can be great, but they are exhaustive, so they can also be exhausting. And this is even more true if English isn't your native language. And instead of reading code that has a lot of meaning embedded in the structure, we're reading a short story describing what the code looks like. It's extremely obtuse compared to something like type definitions, which tell me exactly how I can construct valid programs. To put together an example that both illustrates this very pernicious problem in open source and shows us how we can use LLMs to help solve it, I've put together a prompt that says pretend that I'm speaking Korean. So I'm still typing in English, but all the responses are coming back in Korean. Now, you might not want to read this every day, and it's not the fastest thing for me to read, but it really illustrates the point. In the recent video I did called War for the Open Soul, one of my conclusions was that we really struggle with support across languages. It's really difficult to bootstrap a user group across a language barrier. 
what should really start to make sense now is the power of not just synthesizing the information, like that's great, let's combine all the manuals and doc strings and function source, but we're also simultaneously translating it and summarizing it and giving it a semantic interface, one that's consultative that you can continue to interact with. The sum total of these effects is not just massive for Emacs, this is massive for open source. This is massive for open anything. To paint an accurate picture, it has to be pointed out that none of this is state of the art. I'm not using the latest model. This is not DeepSeek R1. This model has no capacity to think in the background and then show us its conclusion. The model hasn't been fine-tuned. I didn't have a $60,000 stack of GPUs that I ran for a bunch of hours on Emacs source code and Emacs manuals to make it especially good at Emacs. The model that I am using is not even that well trained for tool use because there wasn't any data when these models were being trained. These were some of the first models that supported tool use, so there weren't tool users out there generating the data. And finally, the models are not slowing down. There is a backlog of two or three year old papers that, just like the Transformer paper, eventually we're going to get the production implementation. And this is really important for reducing the size and the runtime cost. This is something that people over on the R Local Llama subreddit are hugely enthusiastic about. These people are all about, we want it local, we want it open source, we want it to be fast and small and good. So how can we be sure that this work is going to have a lot of impact? Probably the biggest change for existing Emacs users is the number of problems that were not worth it that are suddenly totally worth it. The hardest part of diving into unfamiliar source code is not making the changes. It's getting to the places where the changes need to be made. By taking out so much of the low-end work that's a huge part of the upfront cost for working on somebody else's package, a lot more stuff will get done. And unshockingly, a lot of the gains are going to be reinvested directly back into the things that are making it more worth it. A lot of people who were not ready to invest time in building their own integrations are probably about to subscribe to my next video to learn how to build tools and how to set up GPTEL, which is just going to accelerate the whole integration cycle even more. The second big change that we're going to feel in Emacs, but is actually much more massive, is that a lot of markets that have been protected by language barriers and the difficulty of providing support at scale for hugely successful software are suddenly going to have a Berlin Wall falling kind of moment. There's a lot of users who before would not have found it worth it to invest in using software that was only documented in English who will suddenly find themselves instead part of a continuous online community that is no longer fragmented across language barriers. The positive feedback loop is evident here too. I was talking with Karthik about shipping GPTEL with tools built in to integrate it with its own manual and past GitHub issues. That doesn't just scale up the support bandwidth, but it also scales it out to other languages. And finally, we can expect that these changes are going to spread to languages besides just ELISP, and this is huge for Emacs analogs like LIM that are written in common LISP. You can be assured that even if I do absolutely nothing, that integrations are about to show up for Slime and Swank to do this kind of introspection and synthesis in common LISP and in Clojure and in any language that has a REPL where we can interrogate that process to get the documentation and source code. However, as we dip into this source of value, it's going to put more pressure on a runtime that was already under stress from doing language server integrations, and so this pinup demand for moving ELISP over to a runtime that does stuff in a language ecosystem that wants to do more stuff might be reaching a tipping point. At the very least, the biggest headwind for LIM so far has been that it didn't have the mature self-documenting tools of Emacs, and it didn't have all the manuals. But if we're just going to synthesize and translate all of the information anyway, that lack of inertia might just be an advantage. The only people who can really answer this question are common list programmers who might be sitting on the sidelines and might be thinking that common Lisp is a more viable platform for doing what Cursor is trying to do and in integrating a lot of natural and formal tools really deeply. This might be the better time our parentheses have been waiting for. In any case, we can be assured that things are getting more interesting, not less. If you just want to download some stuff and get going, I've put the source code for the tools used in these demos on my GitHub. Just check the commit history. I need to make some updates to those tools, but I also need to finish a PR on GPTEL that's going to make those tools work as well as they did here. It's a lot of work, so buy me a fried chicken. Peace. Whoa. Not bad, partner. Follow me. I'll cover you.